We all have a wide range of behaviors that we can engage in, but most of those behaviors are only appropriate at certain times. So how do we make that decision about when and where to do a certain behavior? Hi, I'm Dr. Igor Yurichevich, and this is Functional Analysis of Behavior 1. Let's go. All right, so today we're going to be taking a look at the phenomenon of stimulus control. And stimulus control is what occurs when we perform certain behaviors, but only under certain circumstances, or as we're going to see more precisely, when certain stimuli are present. So we're going to take a look at the two forms of stimulus control, when stimulus control is in effect, known as stimulus discrimination, and then when stimulus control is not in effect, known as stimulus generalization. So let's begin with when stimulus control is in effect, and we'll take a look at stimulus discrimination. So Cooper, Heron, and Heward mentioned that behavior that occurs more often in the presence of a discriminative stimulus than in its absence is said to be under stimulus control. So just to kind of reiterate something that was mentioned in a previous video, you'll notice that when reading that quote, I did not say SD, which is one way to say discriminative stimulus. However, I rather said the entire phrase out and again, this is something that you should get into the habit of doing because especially in the early going, it's going to allow you to learn more about what these concepts mean and make them a habit of knowing what they mean rather than simply saying SD. When you say discriminative stimulus, you know you're dealing with the stimulus, you know you're dealing with discrimination, and it'll help you understand the material so much better. All right, so backing up one more time. Stimulus discrimination. Cooper, Heron, and Heward mentioned that behavior that occurs more often in the presence of a discriminative stimulus than in its absence is said to be under stimulus control. And this form of stimulus control, or this idea of stimulus control, is something that we do every single day of our life. And we do it anywhere. If you want a real life example, you do this any, anytime that you act differently or behave differently in one environment or one situation as compared to another environment or another situation. So our environments contain stimuli, and many of these stimuli act as discriminative stimuli that place certain behaviors under stimulus control. So for example, hopefully nobody has to have been in a courtroom, but if you are in a courtroom, you probably did not dance. We do not dance in a courtroom. However, we do dance at a barn dance. And in this case, the barn is a discriminative stimulus for dancing. Other example, uh, we often show up late to a party. It's known as being fashionably late. However, we show up on time to work. So party is a discriminative stimulus for showing up late. You will be reinforced if you show up late to a party. You will not be reinforced if you show up late to work. Hence, party is a discriminative stimulus for showing up late. Another example, uh, we don't wear a bathing suit to work with some exceptions, if you're a lifeguard, for example, but normally most people do not wear a bathing suit to work. However, it's not because wearing a bathing suit is a wrong behavior. However, it is not gonna be reinforced at work, but it will be reinforced if you wear a bathing suit to the beach. So in this case, the beach is a discriminative stimulus for wearing a bathing suit and failure to do so at a beach, like if you're overdressed as a beach, that can be seen as a failure of stimulus control. So when a behavior is not under the control of a discriminative stimulus, that is known as a failure of stimulus control. And if it is under the control of a discriminative stimulus so that it occurs more often when that stimulus is present and less often when it's not, that behavior is under uh, stimulus control, under the control of that discriminative stimulus. And uh, just kind of finish these examples. We wear a bathing suit when it's sunny and we're warm. We don't wear bathing suits when it's cold. So sunny and warm are discriminative stimuli for wearing a bathing suit, whereas cold weather and uh, December, for example, are discriminative stimulus for punishment, where they will be punished if you wear a bathing suit under those circumstances. So as you can see, many of our behaviors are under stimulus control. And again, if a behavior occurs more in one context than it does in another, then that demonstrates that that behavior is under stimulus control. And that demonstrates that you are able to engage in stimulus discrimination, namely that you can identify the stimulus that will lead to reinforcement of a behavior and do it under that circumstance when that stimulus is present. 
And you can also identify when the stimulus is not there and you do not engage in the behavior when the stimulus is not there and you will be not reinforced for engaging in that behavior. All right, so that was stimulus discrimination. Now we're gonna take a look at the other side of the stimulus control continuum, and that is stimulus generalization. So Cooper, Heron, and Heward, going back to them, mentioned that stimulus generalization refers to the extent to which stimuli other than the discriminative stimulus acquire stimulus control over the behavior. So we just saw situations where only one discriminative stimulus controls behavior, this is when many other stimuli also acquire that stimulus control, in which case we have stimulus generalization. We generalize to a wide range of stimuli rather than stimulus discrimination, only responding in the presence of one stimulus, not responding in the presence of the other. So we are reinforced for a behavior in the presence of the discriminative stimulus, and then we perform the behavior in the presence of that discriminative stimulus that is stimulus discrimination. However, if we are reinforced for performing a behavior in the presence of a discriminative stimulus, and then we also perform that behavior in the presence of other stimuli, that is known as stimulus generalization because we have generalized that control to other stimuli. All right, so let's take a look at uh, an example of this. So we'll go back to our ancestral roots. So let's say that you are part of a hunter-gatherer society and uh, you get reinforced for hunting wild boar. So you hunt a wild boar, uh, the boar is the discriminative stimulus, and when you uh, hunt that boar, you are reinforced. People are extremely excited, you get a lot of social reinforcers for hunting that boar, so you are reinforced for hunting the wild boar. So in this case, hunting is the behavior, and wild boar is the discriminative stimulus. But then let's say that you exhibit stimulus discrimination. If, sorry, but then let's say that you exhibit stimulus generalization. If that is the case, you will then hunt in the presence of stimuli other than the boar, other than that discriminative stimulus. That is, you will hunt in the presence of leopards, and you will hunt in the presence of panthers, maybe even the rhino in the background. You will hunt gorilla. You will hunt occupy. Octopi. You will hunt octopi. That's the one. You will hunt octopi. So you will hunt a bunch of other stimuli uh, and not be reinforced. However, that is an indication of lack of stimulus control, or in other words, stimulus generalization. All right, so that was an example from our hunter-gatherer ancestry. Let's take a look at a more contemporary example, and that is what do we wear? So let's say that you are at a dance and you are wearing yourself a nice tailored suit and you were reinforced for wearing that suit. Let's say that you got a lot of social reinforcement for wearing that suit. In this case, wearing the suit is the behavior and being at a dance is the discriminative stimulus. So you are more likely in the future to wear that suit to a dance because you are reinforced with that discriminative stimulus present. However, you might start wearing that suit to other places where the discriminative stimulus of the dance is not present. So you might start wearing it at home and you might start wearing it to go shopping. You might wear it to go to the hair salon. You might wear it to go to cheerleading practice. You might even wear it when you're doing parkour in the city. And you might even wear partial suits to the beach. And these are all examples of stimulus generalization. You have never been re reinforced for wearing your suit at home while shopping, going to the hair salon, cheerleading practice, parkour in the city or to the beach. However, you generalized that behavior to other stimuli because you were reinforced at the dance. The dance was your discriminative stimulus but you did not engage in stimulus discrimination, you engaged in stimulus generalization, hence suit wearing behavior became uh, a behavior that occurred in other contexts, hence stimulus generalization. And you'll note in that final example that at the beach, uh, the person is not wearing a full suit. And this is an, is an example of what occurs oftentimes in stimulus generalization, that the behavior is often weaker in the presence of those other stimuli rather than the original discriminative stimulus. So in this case, the behavior is a little bit weaker, wore part of the suit, didn't wear a jacket, didn't wear a tie at the beach. However, still stimulus generalization, even though the behavior is a little less intense, a little weaker. Okay, so we just saw stimulus discrimination and stimulus generalization. So if you want to engage in stimulus control or if you want a behavior under stimulus control, how do you get it to be under stimulus control? That is, how do you get that stimulus discrimination? And we do this through stimulus discrimination training. So in stimulus discrimination training, 
Responses in the presence of one stimulus condition, the discriminative stimulus, are reinforced, and responses in the presence of the other stimuli are not reinforced. And these other stimuli are discriminative stimuli for extinction. That is what that little S delta means, discriminative stimuli for extinction. So let's read that through one more time, get into that habit. Uh, responses in the presence of one stimulus condition, the discriminative, discriminative stimulus, are reinforced, and responses in the presence of the other stimuli, discriminative stimulus for extinction, are not reinforced. So the way that this works is, let's go back to that boar hunting example. Initially, the boar was hunted and the hunting behavior was reinforced. That led to stimulus generalization. But over numerous trials, you can get discrimin stimulus discrimination training if hunting is reinforced in the presence of the boar, but then hunting is not reinforced in the presence of the jaguar. So when you hunt the boar, you get a lot of social reinforcers. You hunt the jaguar, no social reinforcers. Hunt a boar, lots of social reinforcers. Hunt the panther, no social reinforcers. Hunt the boar, lots of social reinforcers. Hunt the gorilla, no social reinforcers. Hunt the boar, lots of social reinforcers. Hunt the octopus, no social reinforcers. Eventually, stimulus discrimination will be achieved and the hunting will only occur in the presence of the boar, that discriminative stimulus, and not in the presence of other animals, which have become discriminative stimuli for extinction. And this means the next time that this hunter goes out into the field and they see a boar, they will engage in hunting behavior. But if they see a panther, they will not engage in hunting behavior. Hence, stimulus control has occurred. All right, so that is the end of this uh, video. So today we introduced the idea of stimulus control. We took a look at stimulus discrimination when a behavior occurs more often in the presence of the discriminative stimulus. We took a look at stimulus generalization when behavior occurs in the presence of stimuli other than the discriminative stimulus. And then lastly, we took a look at stimulus discrimination training and basically how you can attain stimulus control by reinforcing a behavior in the presence of a discriminative stimulus, but not reinforcing it in the absence of that discriminative stimulus, or more importantly, in the presence of other stimuli than the discriminative stimulus. So that is what I wanted to cover for today. Uh, join us next time when we take a look at a further look at stimulus control and take a look at response and stimulus prompts. Uh, but until then, thank you for joining me. I hope to see you next time and uh, stay frosty. Stay functional. All right, so some of you may have noticed this. So I just wanted to let you know that the mustache is new. You don't have to go look for it in previous videos. And uh, it is for Halloween because when I do Halloween, I do authentic and I commit. And uh, if you want to know what the costume is, uh, join me for the next video. That is right. This is a post-credit stinger uh, to make sure that you tune in next time.